Well, it's eight o'clock, eight o one. Um, none of us have any titles or authority, so shut me up if you want me to stop talking. But just in the interest of getting this meeting rolling, I'm going to call the meeting to order and ask Olivia to do a roll call. All right. Longmont Housing Authority Advisory Board members present are Cameron Grant, Tom DeBee, Arlene Zortman, Lauren Selly, and Jean Christopher. We also have Harold Dominguez, Lisa Gallinar, Karen Roney, and Kathy Bedler. Uh, well, I think the, the first item of business probably that isn't on the agenda would be to appoint someone to chair this meeting. You know, I used to be the chair of this old organization called the Housing Authority, but this is a brand new organization. Um, and I'm not going to presume that, uh, that anybody wants me to do the job. So um, I would suggest if anyone is interested in running these meetings, I'll step back really quickly. Cameron, you have done so well. I think that you need to continue on. I was afraid of that. Yeah, I'll second well, that. <laughs> all right, motion second. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, I'll continue on. Uh, so item number two, agenda revisions and submission of documents should have received an agenda and packet from Olivia last week. Do you have any uh, changes or additions or documents, Harold? Cameron, you need a vice chair. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, great. Cameron? Chairman, yes. I would like to nominate Tom to be for vice chair. I second that. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion or uh, frantic backpedaling by nominees? <laughs> no, there's no, there's no backpedaling. All right, all in favor. Unanimously approved. Welcome. Thank you, Harold, for that reminder. Um, so now we'll move on to item three, or item two, agenda revisions and submission of documents, and then we'll lump that in with item three, the approval of the agenda. Uh, so if you have any revisions, let us know, or Karen might have uh, some input. Cameron, I have a question. So um, am, is anyone looking at a different agenda than what uh, Cameron is reading? I might be looking at the wrong one then, am I? Well, it's not following oh, yeah, the one I, I, I have. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's where I was like. Well, there you, you go. So, so you did anyone want to rethink the uh, the election of the chair of this committee? Uh, no. Let, let me get back into my actual agenda here. Sorry about that. All right. I, I think all is good, and you're on uh, number three, which <laughs> is discussing the meeting date oh, here it time. Is. Ah, there we go. Sorry, now I'm on the right script. Uh, meeting date and time, any changes? So, so we're meeting today on the, the regularly, previously regularly scheduled meeting of the Housing Authority, uh, which seemed to work for all of us when we were on that board. But this is a great opportunity to adjust that if we want to consider a different time or a different day. Um, but we will continue to meet monthly on a fixed date. So any discussion of other options beside, besides uh, continuing on with the, the 8 o'clock Tuesday schedule that we established um, with LHA? So I see no discussion or, of that. So I would suggest that we continue on with that. Um, we might as well do it formally. So do we have a motion to continue with, what is this, the third Tuesday of the month at 8 a.m.? I move that we continue with the third Tuesday of the month at 8 a.m. I can second that. Motion and a second. All in favor? Unanimously approved. Uh, so let's roll on to item number four, designation of the 2021 Longman Housing Authority Advisory Board meeting posting location. And I can't recall where we posted LHA 
notification, but my thought would be continuing that to post in the, the similar location would be helpful, but Karen, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, Cameron. So I believe that um, because this is now a, an advisory board that, um, that advises the city council as a board of commission, um, I would say that our now that our um, primary posting of all advisory board notices is on is on the city's website, we now have a, a prime gov um, designation for each of the advisory boards, and so so I think the recommendation is that the um, this the city website is the primary designation, and then you absolutely can um, designate. Uh, other locations, which you might want to have be the, um, you know, the LHA website, as well as the, um, and the notices on the, on the um, LHA admin building, but that's really up to you. So, so one option would be that we designate uh, kind of three locations for posting notices of our meetings. One would be the uh, LHA office building. A second would be the LHA website, and the third would be the city's website for posting notification of advisory board meetings. If that's acceptable, uh, Kathy, I just had a question. If you po if you identify three, then are you locked into all three, and every single one has to be, or do you want to do a primary, and then we'll that's work as point. hard as we can to do the other two or or yeah. one? Yeah, if, if, if we did that, <clears throat> the, the, the option would be designating the city's advisory board meeting location as the primary location. And then to the extent we can get it done, just for informational purposes, we'll, we'll post it in other locations, which might include the LHA building and the LHA website. Tom? Couldn't we just also just <laughs> have a link over to the city? on any of like, say the, the Longmont Housing Authority, just say, hey, all, all meetings will be posted on the, on the city's website. Here's a link as well. I, I think that's a good idea. I think the, the, I think the issue Kathy raises is we wanna make sure that if something goes wrong with that link, that doesn't jeopardize proper notice for the meeting. So I think we definitely should strive to do that pretty consistently but the, the key would be let's just get it on the the city's advisory meeting notification list and then anything else we add is just expanded notice so i'd entertain a motion to designate the city's advisory board website uh, as the notification official notification location for posting meetings of the LHA Advisory Board. I so move. Second. We have a motion by Gene, a second by Tom. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. We have unanimous approval. Uh, and then number five, approve the minutes from the December 15th, 2020 meeting. I suppose since we are no longer the Longmont Housing Authority, uh, we probably don't have the official authority to rubber stamp these, but since we were the group meeting, we, it's incumbent upon us to make a recommendation that the LHA approve those minutes when they have their next meeting, would be my guess, uh, procedurally. So those were in our packet. Um, are there any discussions or revisions? And if yeah, not, Cameron. does someone have a motion to approve? Yeah, Cameron, there's one uh, misspelling on item eight, uh, the word violation, and the last sentence of item eight, if that could be corrected, and then we can approve them as corrected and recommend to the city. Any other comments or changes? If not, I would recommend a motion to, or excuse me, I would entertain a motion to recommend approval of the minutes of the December 15th, 2020 meeting. All right, so move. Second. We have a motion by Gene, second by Lauren. All in favor, raise your hand.
motion carries by unanimous approval. And now we're on to item six, public invited to be heard. And looking at our packet, looks to me like this information was published and that if anyone wanted to join us publicly, they'd contact Nicole to uh, confirm their interest. So uh, Nicole, do you have any information about people that want to speak? No, Cameron, I do not. Um, Olivia, did you get any notice? It might've been her name on the agenda, Cameron. That's why I'm just double checking with her. Okay. Um, I didn't, I think it did say Nicole. So I think we should be good to go. Yep, I got nothing, but I do have my email up in case anybody wants in during the meeting. Great. Well, with, with no public requesting to be heard, we'll roll on to item number seven. Review, consider recommendation for the following policies. And we have three, and I think we'll do them one at a time. One is the reasonable accommodation policy, another is tenant selection policy, and the third is the physical alteration policy. Um, and I've read through these, but if there's somebody in the meeting who has a, a little more versed in what we're doing here that wants to discuss this, that would be helpful. Kathy? So these, if you remember, are um, the policies that were required to be updated as part of the voluntary compliance agreement with HUD. Um, so we have been working since early 2020 to pull these together with our legal firm. Um, they've gone back and forth to HUD um, a couple of different times, at least two or three times, HUD has finally approved them. So the next step then is to have this board make a recommendation and then we'll have the LHA board um, do a final approval. Um, and then we are required by the voluntary compliance agreement to send these out to all of our tenants, um, as well as make them available to incoming tenants um, and there's some reporting that goes along, particularly with the reasonable accommodation policy as well that we'll have to do to, <clears throat> to HUD for, I don't know how long, <laughs> a couple of years, a year, I don't know, <laughs> doesn't state. Um, but these are the first three policies. There might be a couple more that are coming to you. I think um, we still have to do a grievance policy. And I'll go through all this when we get to the last item, which is a review of the voluntary compliance agreement, but basically had to revise these three policies to meet HUD compliance. HUD has reviewed them and approved them. And then maybe stepping back for those of you who um, didn't have the pleasure of, of uh, sitting down with HUD to talk about their assessment of the LHA and the LHA's um, compliance with rules, regulations, and, and statutes. Uh, they, they came in and did an audit of the housing authority, which they do of, of all agency agencies that they fund. They don't do it consistently. So it's, it's, it's like an IRS audit. You hope you never get one, but when you do, you hope you, you stand up. They did identify a number of areas uh, that were where they thought we needed to increase our um, proficiency in, in following the rules. Basically, I said, here, you're out of compliance in these, these areas. So we entered into an agreement called the Voluntary Compliance Agreement, which is later in the agenda, which outlined the issues that uh, they identified that they would like us to improve our performance within where, where they'd like us to improve our performance, and then a plan for how we would roll that out. Uh, and it included a schedule, which... Um, was ambitious at the outset and then you know, COVID came along, which made it even more difficult. But speaking to this reasonable accommodation definition and LHA policy, the Longwood Housing Authority is obligated to follow um, the rules under section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Whether we have a policy or not, we're, we're obligated to follow it. This policy is just a description um, for the general public and for HUD, which provides money to us, that describes how we will ensure that we're following it. So that, that's the rationale. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it looks pretty comprehensive to me, and my understanding, Kathy, is that that this has been back. Has this been back and forth with HUD yet? Yeah. And, and so, yes, so now we're at a point where HUD, HUD HUD says this is okay. Our council say says this is okay. Um, and so at this point, I'd entertain a motion to 
recommend that the LHA approve this. I we can certainly have discussion after okay. that. Okay. I'll move to approve. I'll second it. So we have a motion and a second, and now we're ripe for discussion. Um, I do have a couple of comments on on this, um, and um, they're more like clarifying. Um, under uh, it's on page two of six. Uh, the term "structural infeasibility" infeasible should that be structurally infeasible? Is that of the um, 504, the reasonable accommodation yeah. policy? It's on It's on the uh, reasonable accommodation policy. Page yeah, I, Jean, I cut that too. Um, and that was kind of going to be my question. If there are, um, there aren't many, but there's a couple of um, yeah. edits. And then we need to change, Kathy, your email yeah, address. I so I'm that. assuming mm -hmm. that those those items that really aren't substantive, just some uh, minor edits, we probably can, I'm assuming we can do that. Yes. All right, there's um, an, uh, an item uh, seven. Oh. I, I wanted clarification. Um, if LHA receives a request that can be approved immediately thereafter, it will approve the request. Um, the implication there is that um, we've received this kind of request before, so we know it's going to be approved. Is that why the word thereafter is in there? Where, where are you? Uh, it's item seven, page four. So to me, the comma should be after approved. And it, I think it's just trying to say that it, we will do this in a timely fashion. And we do this. As soon as I get yeah. it, I review it. And unless there's some other follow-up that has to happen, we, we approve it if we can immediately. OK, I just wanted clarification. Uh, and then on item eight, um, if additional info cannot be provided within seven days, the resident, um, uh, I should pull it up, but it has the word, please contact the city, uh, the, the community manager. And I think what we need there is to keep the language consistent. Instead of saying, please contact, it's the resident should must contact. contact. Mm -hmm. Do you, yeah. And uh, then items 9, 10, and 11 all seem to be talking about the same thing. Is that the intention here of the interactive dialogue? I think it's the, to me, it's the evolution of the interactive dialogue. Okay. Okay. Which is why it's three separate items. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the grievance pr pr uh, process, and I'm glad you've had this back and forth with HUD. Um, I was looking at you have an informal hearing, and or the complaint with HUD. Um, would there be any benefit of putting uh, a request for mediation before the complaint for HUD with HUD? Well, so. Part, even though HUD approved this, they also in the VCA follow-up have said we need to submit a separate grievance policy. Here it is. Okay. Um, which I assume would go into more detail. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So HUD, LHA must submit a grievance policy or an amended grievance policy that contain complaints pertaining to any action prohibited by 504, blah, blah. So I think they just want this... Um, broadened a little bit or more detail okay. around this and so that it stands separate. So we'll be working on that next. Okay. Thank you. 
And I'll note the email needs to be changed. Arlene, did you have some comments? <clears throat> They're really sort of more of a clarification. Um, on page two, under reasonable accommodations, where it talks about the um, disability access, um, if the accommodation is um, denied, how many of them, if any, have you guys done? Um, <clears throat> Many have we alternative done? accommodation is available, or um, how many of them have you actually had to deal with? If any, I mean. That we have to, had to deny, or that are, how many in total have we dealt with this year? Well, it's saying if the requested accommodation is structurally infeasible, causes undue financial administrative burden, um, LHA will engage in an interactive process to determine if an alternative accommodation is available or appropriate. Um, we haven't, does we that haven't come had, up frequently? No, we haven't had any so far um, since I have been here that have been around this. I think that was the thought process behind um, when the former director was here and some tub replacements were denied um, and that we ended up having to pay um, the, the clients to, to replace those. So um, it has to be pretty unable to be modified <laughs> to, to deny something, but we haven't had any that I have had to deny for um, being structurally infeasible or um, too expensive or anything like that. It's the ones I've denied have been around the letter didn't support the disability or they I asked for more information around it and never got it kind of thing um, so okay okay then under a notification of policies on that same page I noticed that it doesn't list other languages are these listed in other languages at all or are you relying on interpreters to um, deal with that right now we do not have um, our policies or um, documents um, translated um, into Spanish. That is something we're gonna work on in particular Spanish because that's our primary <clears throat> minority language mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> as we get more stable and move forward, we're going to start working on that, but there is ability to translate verbally for anyone. And you feel comfortable with that? Is that done by interpreters you hire? It is mostly by city staff or LHA staff when we had okay. that. So, so what we have in place is we have different tiers of uh, Spanish language interpreters in the organization, um, tier one, two, and three, um, or tier three will um, typically be involved in the translation. Sometimes on legal documents, we actually have a contract where we farm that out for them to do it. Um, but in the event of someone needing assistance, um, we definitely try to get into that structure and get an appropriate person uh, based on the need at the time. Okay, so if a person is not can't read, how is that handled, if they even will admit it? Are you talking Spanish speaker or? Any, any of them. Even, you would even have English speakers who can't read. Also. Correct, that's why. Yeah. I think that's where we have to just inform. I mean, we have to just go through and, and have that conversation and work through the documents uh, via the staff members. Yeah. Okay. The housing choice voucher specialists in particular are really good at that. Um, and they interpret, if you will, <laughs> the legalese sometimes that's in the voucher program. Um, they do a lot of explanation around why we need certain documents and what why we need this document versus another document kind of thing. Um, so they're pretty well versed in, in um, figuring out if somebody is having problems or an issue around that. Okay, all right. Um, on page three under uh, examples of reasonable accommodation, how do you determine under the um, service or assistance animal, a service or an emotional support animal is appropriate? If a doctor or a some somebody who knows them and is willing to write a letter um, says that they have a disability and that this animal will assist with that, 
we do have to accept it. Okay. Um, I'm getting to the end here. <laughs> um, what do you know? I'm on page five under um, request. Well, actually, it's it's the last paragraph in that first section under 11. What is considered a reliable third party? It says documentation of reasonable accommodations goes on and it says, you know, a doctor, a physician, whatever, mm -hmm. or a reliable third party. What is considered a reliable third party? It's really somebody who knows that person. Um, so it might be, it could be a pastor. It could be, um, you know, a member of their family. It could be somebody that is, um, knows about the the disability and what their maybe needs an, are. Maybe an agency. An agency, right. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Those are, those are both great sets of comments. Thank you for reading through it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments on the reasonable accommodation policy. Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the Longmont Housing Authority reasonable accommodation policy? I think Jean and already mo moved and Arlene approved. Oh yeah, we did have, we had a motion and, and, a, yeah, and a second discussion, apologies yeah. for that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I haven't had my full cup of coffee this morning, so I apologize. <laughs> Um, I would just add that well, that we move to um, to accept it with the the minor changes that need to be made that were addressed. Gina, you okay with that amendment? I'll second. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second with that that modification. All in favor? Unanimously approved. The next item on our agenda would be the tenant selection policy. Uh, Kathy or Karen, would one of you like to give us a little bit of background on that? Well, this is another one uh, that we didn't have a clear policy on how, um, um, who's eligible to be in the different properties. We had a lot of information on the Housing Choice Voucher Program as that's required by HUD, but not um, as much on each individual property. So again, this was part of the voluntary compliance agreement that we um, have this in place. Again, HUD has reviewed this a number of times. We've been back and forth on it. Um, and so this is the their final approved product for that. Do we have any a motion? Yeah, I'll, I will move to approve uh, in order to have discussion. Okay. We had a motion by Jean and a second by Tom. Any discussion? Uh, yes. Um, uh, item 4.4 um, mentions the HOME units at Briarwood, um, but they don't mention the HOME units at Aspen Meadows and Aspen Meadows neighborhood because um, both of those properties have HOME. Should that be included in this document? Um, as long, actually, I mean, we have that information as long as um, the AMIs are appropriate. I think that's the more important thing um, mm -hmm. that we have to follow. Yeah, I was just, um, uh, the reference was made for Briarwood. Right. Yeah, and HOME is one of those other uh, considerations for those two properties. So, yeah. but if it's you know, um, if if it's okay not to not to mention it, that's fine. I'll check and see. I think that we probably could make that adjustment here. By the way, I will say it is awesome to see a policy on this. Um, that's one thing that's been sorely missing. 
Um, I do have another question on unit transfer. Um, the, um, oh, I think it is, where is it? Um, uh, Page 13. Yeah, when we're, you're talking about a, uh, a household that's been offered a just um, an accessible unit, even though the household does not have disabilities, mm -hmm. and then someone comes in that needs that unit, uh, and moving the household that doesn't have disabilities to another unit. Um, the um, comment is made that the household that does not have disabilities will move at their own expense. And I'm wondering, uh, uh, considering under item 17, uh, when, it, when there's a transfer, there's no longer a required new security deposit. So moving at their own expense is simply moving from one unit to another unit in the building. Is that the scenario we're looking at? Yes. Okay. So it's really that they would be responsible for moving their own furniture and everything. Yeah. 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 I just didn't know if that, it, I, I was pleased to see that there isn't going to be a, a new security deposit charge for just a transfer. So I just wanted to make sure those, when it said at, at their own expense, it's simply the moving from one unit to another. Okay, thank you. And, and the, way, the way I read this, Kathy, is that um, if that situation arises, that household must agree to move so so they'd be notified in advance that they're moving into a one of these units and that it's subject to potential relocate relocation before they sign the lease and move in yes it's it's yeah. part of the lease yeah it, it's in it's in the in the lease for all of the disabled units right yes yeah, okay awesome and then they can't take place the first the first Tom, I don't know if everyone else is hearing this, but your audio is pretty jumbled on my end. Yeah. Yeah, mine yeah. too. Wow. <laughs> Tom, you may have to uh you may have to log out and log back in. Okay, okay. I will. Oh wow. <laughs> Unless we have a lip reader in the group, we can have it. <laughs> Okay, maybe not. Is um, Nicole still on? Yeah. Yeah, Harold, I'm here. All right, you're going to have to catch him again. Yeah, right. I got him. So, so, Gene, it sounds like you've wrapped up. Arlene, do you have some comments or questions? Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, on page 14, where it talks about non-discrimination, my question is, is sexual orientation not included in non-discrimination uh, non at the federal, state, and local levels? All right, I'm trying to find where you're at. You. Well, it's number two, non-discrimination. And it lists all of the different, we forbid discrimination based on, it goes through and lists a whole bunch of them. And I was under the impression sexual orientation was also that, but I did, but yeah, her, yeah. Um, I think sexual orientation may be state only. That's what I'm thinking. Or local, um, although it does say state. State and local. Right. Um, but these list only the federal. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can check into that. That I do not know why. Okay. If it says state and local, why those aren't listed as well and maybe identified as state and local? Okay. Not that I don't think we have anything extra, but I know like City of Boulder does, but state. I think you might be right. My recollection is that during the Obama administration, there was an executive order mm -hmm. that 
that added sexual orientation <laughs> in as a protected class. Yes. But I wouldn't be shocked if that executive order might have changed in the last four years. Uh, I'm, just, I, I'm not sure. Okay. Ask us again tomorrow afternoon. It might be different. <laughs> okay. Um, do you at all ask for immigration status? Is that even allowed? Yes, they, um, residents have to be legally present. That is something that's required with federal funding. Legally, okay. Okay. All right. On page um, six, under 5.3 social security number requirement, you've listed all of the units there with the exception of Spring Creek. Is Spring, does Spring Creek not require that? No, that's just an oversight. Thank you for catching that. Um, on page 17 under 6.5, where it um, new hire reports, where it talks about report changes in income when the household's income changes, increases by 200 or more per month. I guess my concern is people who have children who want to actually get some part-time jobs, is that going to be a si significant change that they have to report? And is that going to cause a problem with their um, payments? Anybody in the household over 18 is what is okay. counted as income. Anyone under 18 is not. Okay. That answers that. Um, that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Any other comments or discussion? Excellent. Oh, Tom. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. All right. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I had a question on um, 4.1. It, it's kind of weird. The, the last check mark there says must be households only resident. And it says, you know, el elderly households of no more than two persons, with at least one person who is 62 years. It's just, I, I'm kind of confused on why that language is in there when it says must be household only resident is they can't, it just, they can't own a house somewhere else or be renting a house somewhere else oh is that it what must, that means okay so it's yeah. not the residents that we're talking about okay yeah. i see all right and then the other the other part too is kind of that the criminal background check um you know, I, under, I understand felonies but like drug related misdemeanors um where, and we're looking at the last five years, is this kind of standard with HUD or? What yeah. section are you looking at? Sorry, Sorry. Uh, this is under 3.1 under criminal 3 background okay. check. And Lisa might have better knowledge of that than, than I do, but you know, drugs are not allowed in federal property, period, end right. of story. Nope, yes. I understand. But if, you know, a person's trying to get clean and all that mm -hmm. stuff, um, we're looking at the last five years. I mean, is that pretty standard? Yes, that's just okay. the industry standard that HUD okay. makes us follow, especially with okay. methamphetamines and right. felonies. Yep, okay. I know it seems kind of harsh, but um, BCHA has dealt with quite a few myths um, smoked in and cooked properties and the cost to remediate those units is astronomical, especially yeah. with they share HVAC and shared walls because mm -hmm. um, then you're displacing other residents. So while mm -hmm. I agree, it seems kind of harsh for people who are trying to live a better life. It's, it's kind of unfortunate, but it's kind of just how it goes. Yeah. Do we have, does LHA have a a policy around um, methamphetamine remediation where you try to go after um, residents, even though we know that that's useless for financial reasons. I'm not sure that it's a written policy, but we've dealt with this uh, yeah. quite a bit actually and, and tried different approaches and I think settled on an approach that is reasonably effective. That's good, okay. And it's a lease violation. If they violate the lease, they're they're obligated to pay the damages. We just have mm -hmm. some situations where they may not be able to. 
Um, I'd ask a question about that same criminal background check. Uh, you know, what it does, it doesn't say applicants shall be denied residency if this is the fact. This this happens says they may be denied. So there's still some discretion on the part of the LHA, which uh, part of me thinks is nice because you can look at the facts of the specific situation. But the attorney in me gets a little nervous about discretion and how we actually apply that discretion. Um, that's more of just a comment without a suggestion that I don't know if if uh, anyone else has a concern about that. Well, I mean, my, my thing is too, is, I mean, the documentation too. So if we do have somebody that, you know, does have say a drug related misdemeanor within the last five years, are we documenting why we're allowing this person in? Um, or is it, you know, most time, if it's a may, but we're following the rules 100%, then there is no no need for documentation, obviously. But like what? So if we do have an exception that we are allowing, is there the documentation in place? So again, Lisa might have a, a better um, take on this since she is the um, overseeing the properties. But my take is that we are pretty much following the letter of the law. And so that there isn't additional documentation. I don't remember any that have been let in as an exception um, for that, unless we simply didn't know about it. Kathy is dead on. I, mm -hmm. We basically, this is the, what we follow. And since I've been here, I haven't seen any, I'm running all the criminal background checks for LHA now. So if there's anything, they're being denied. Uh, if I can comment, um, our biggest problem has not been on criminal background checks. It's been on people who uh, have violated and have used drugs, and there was no sign in a criminal background check that they had been ever caught at it. And we got stuck with the cleanup bill. Yeah. Do we have any other comments or discussion? All right, well, we have some suggested cleanup items. Um, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I guess I would suggest a, a modification to the motion that it, it include the cleanup items that we've discussed today. Okay. And with that, all in favor? Any opposed? We've got unanimous approval. So we'll move on to the third policy, which is, I get back up to my agenda, the physical alteration policy. And I think this is part of the same process that we've been going through with uh, the v VCA, uh, although it's a much shorter one, so I'm guessing our discussion might not take quite so long. Uh, We have a motion on this. Do we do we need any preamble to this, Kathy or Karen? I would guess not. So I, I don't have anything. I, I move that we uh, accept the physical alteration policy. I second. A it. second. Great. We have a motion by Tom and I think Arlene by a nose. This, <laughs> this is the second. Um, any discussion? Seeing no discussion, uh, all in favor? Unanimously approved. Excellent, so now we are moving on uh, to item eight, discussion of potential advisory board work plan items for 2021. And as if, if you'll look at section eight of the Longmont Housing Authority bylaws, which were approved, I believe at the January 5th uh, city council or housing authority meeting. Um, there is a section that describes us, what our, our committee is supposed to do. Um, and at this point, I think we had to talk about how we intend to operate, what we might want to include it in our work plan and any other comments or suggestions you have. Lauren? I just noticed that um, article seven and article eight are both titled article seven. 
miscellaneous should be eight. I just noticed that too. Because <laughs> I was turning to it. I'm like, wait, that's not right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. We will, we will correct that. Just saw All that right. Too. Thanks. There's a lot of details <laughs> so, that we have to pay attention to better. I know it's so hard, especially when you've looked at a document for like yeah. weeks and weeks. Yeah. <laughs> So Cameron, you know, I think um, we put this on there is, uh, yeah, so in Article 7, there are, and, and in Section 3, there are um, those duties hopefully reflect the direction that, that you all gave us um, when you were still the Housing uh, Authority Board. And so really, this is an opportunity if, if you all have, want to have some discussion or you have some other ideas um, in particular, or maybe Harold or Kathy or Lisa have ideas about um, anything this particular year that you would like to see us place on, um, you know, kind of, we call it a work plan. It's really the schedule of, of activities, things that you want to make sure that, um, that we address as staff, bring back to the advisory board, um, anything with more detail in regard to those particular duties is, is really what we're looking at. And if you don't have any, that's okay too. We just wanted to open that up for um, conversation. I like the list of duties. And I think at least for the near term, while we're figuring out our role and how best to su support the housing authority, I might suggest that one thing we do is we, we serve as um, a body that can provide a little more focused evaluation of things that that you all as the staff think it would be helpful for that LHA board um, to have support on. So you know, if there's something that, that you, you want us to dig in and make a recommendation that might be helpful when the board gets to, to consideration, I, I would suggest we just defer to you on what ought to be on our list. Um, in addition to these issues that are outlined in section three. Well, so one suggestion I might make because we've had some discussions around this is what role might the LHA begin to have as a partner or a, a nonprofit possible partner in inclusionary housing projects. Um, so becoming familiar with the inclusionary housing program and how LHA might position itself to um, become a, play, a, a bigger player, I guess, in, in, that, um, in that program. Um, there is a substantial amount of funding that's likely to come in. There are opportunities to partner with um, the developers at the front end. Um, and you guys have been in the past a large recipient of land donations that you have been able to um, provide a lot more affordable units at a lot lower incomes than we would otherwise have gotten um, by um, being able to take those land donations and sit on them for a while um, and or develop them right away depending on the funding. Um, so really starting to anticipate where are we going to do development next or where should we be looking at development next um, might be something to more immediately start thinking about. Um, that would just be a suggestion I would have to throw out. I like that, Kathy. And as, as you were talking about that, I was thinking back to um, the several times that, that Harold made his presentation to us as the LHA and to city council on this whole concept of the city getting involved. And I, and I think there was a section, if I remember right, on opportunities. You know, what are, what are some of the things that might, might happen uh, in the positive uh, stemming from this uh, collaboration between the LHA and the city or this combination of it. Uh, and, and so maybe it's, it'd be helpful for our group 
to focus on those and put some some thought and suggestions in front of the LHA um, that might you know, help further some of those objectives. I think one of them, Kathy, is exactly what you were talking about with the inclusionary housing process and uh, and others. I think are just general ways to um, identify opportunities for affordable housing in the city and, and, and means that the LHA as an organization might collaborate differently than it has in the past. It's a slight change of focus, if, uh, uh, which is refreshing, but I think we're a little out of practice. We're very practiced at dealing with crises. <laughs> and reacting to to situations that pop up unexpectedly, and so we'll need to stretch our wings a little bit on uh, some more big picture, proactive thinking and planning. Um, I, I really uh, like that. Maybe Cameron. this serves as a draft. Yeah. yeah. I was just going to say, I really, I really like that um, what you were saying, and and kind of the second half of the duties um, being more involved in the community input. Um, it, it reminds me of. Um, when I started working with uh, BCHA and the county attorney's office there, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Twin Lakes property, but there was a lot of community engagement um, that was direct between residents and BCHA. And, and I feel like if there had been more of a mediator, you know, community representing those community members, um, it would have probably been a little less contentious. I don't know, but um, I, I kind of see that that's how we could could be a role um, is to to really work with communities and like you said, looking at opportunity. Sorry, I'm having a lot of pain right now because I'm very pregnant. Oh, oh <laughs> um, such a heart. Yeah. <laughs> I have really bad heartburn, so trying not to choke I on my words. I hope you get over it soon. <laughs> Eleven <laughs> weeks. <laughs> um, but working, you know working on future goals and opportunities and kind of take some of that responsibility um, off of the board because, you know, they're not going to have a lot of time to, to look at these things and they're not going to be as involved with that. And, and I think we really could help um, the city staff in looking at those things, especially with the community engagement, because we, we aren't the board anymore and we don't work for the city. So we're kind of in the middle. So I kind of mm -hmm. like that, that idea. We're in that nice no pressure role where um, we don't have any, we're not actually responsible for implementing any of these things. We just throw out ideas and then critique people who don't follow them. Uh, Cameron, I want to, I, I agree with everything Lauren said, um, but I also want to follow up on something you said. I would like um, to see specifics come from staff at our next meeting on, um, and as, as Kathy mentioned, uh, getting involved with the inclusionary housing program. Are there other things within the city um, that staff is aware of where we can be stepping out and getting more, um, getting more informed and more involved about? So I, I would like to see that come to us at the next meeting. Yeah, even like some subcommittees that we talked about initially yeah. and then doing some community engagement. Unfortunately, COVID sort of put the nail in that coffin. But, um, you know, it would be really nice. That I, that's part of the reason why I joined is I wanted to get involved with community and and, and, yeah. and do some of these things. And, and so I, Jean, I, I really agree. And I like that, that idea. Um, so there's a, a couple of things that we can bring forward next time. One is the, the Boulder County Regional Affordable Housing Partnership Plan, which I think you guys have seen a long time ago or we have mentioned, but um, they have an effort called the Home Team um, or Home Together Now, I think it's called, where it is advocating for um, community outreach and how to um, talk to your <laughs> elected officials about um, the housing needs in the community. And then a group called ECHO, which is East County Housing something or other. <laughs> I forget what the last 
um, stands for, but they're doing a series of webinars. So I'll send a link to that to you guys because they are providing really interesting information about housing needs um, in Boulder County, as well as um, advocacy types of efforts um, around that. So that might be something just to keep in the future. And the next one coming up, I think is February 8th. So in, I'll send a link to that one before your, um, since it will be before your next meeting. That would be great. Any other discussion or suggestions on the, the work plan? Great. So we'll, I, I presume we can we can come back and revisit this as we get our, our feet under us a little better at, uh, uh, in this form of the organization. Uh, but let's move on to item number nine, the city report. Harold, would you so, take Harold, the lead on I this or, is there, or is Karen? Yeah. Or, I'm having issues i'm having to come in and out so um can you go real quick i'm trying to i don't know what's going on with my system okay. so i'll make a, a couple of comments and then maybe harold is is coming back in so um because we have several different items here but um i, I do want to um let you know that we we are bringing new staff members on board at the um at the housing authority so we have hired a um a new housing choice voucher specialist her name is rhonda hill uh she will be starting her position uh next monday we also have hired um, a new accounting supervisor and that is uh our own uh kendra daniels who worked with the uh city she's uh we did not scare her away. She, <laughs> um, so she's taken on the role of the uh, account, accounting supervisor. And um, so we have now the accountant, we have the accounting supervisor, uh, both hired. Uh, Kendra will actually start her official position on um, next Monday also, I believe, is her official start date. And we are still in the process of, um, of hiring an um, account uh, a technician, but we do have several um, applicants that have, we received applications and uh, and are going through the process for that um, that hire. I think the, um, the the property staff members that we have hired. I will defer that to item B, and Lisa can talk a little bit more about that. She's been active in uh, in that hiring. So so we um, we. We're, we're, feeling, we're feeling encouraged. We are bringing on some staff members who are um, contributing right away and, uh, and are really, um, really helping us to move forward. And kind of how we have talked about this internally as staff is that, um, you know, 2020 is really the year of um, stabilization and, and, uh, and growth and, um, and, Something else that Harold's going to say. <laughs> so, 2021. 20, oh, oh, 2021. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, and one more thing. Yes. <laughs> well, we, we won't talk about what 2020 was, but yes, 2021 um, is, uh, is as of uh, certainly stabilization and, and growth. So, um, so that's, those are the comments I wanted to make. And Harold, you might want to, yeah. Um, yeah, you might few. be ready to add. I don't know what was happening. I think I was having the same issue Tom was. I kept coming in and out and losing everything. So if you can't hear me, just somebody raise their hands. Uh, so first, yeah, I think 2021, a year of stabilization. I think there's a few things that are going to be happening this year. Um, Karen and Kathy and I have talked about this a little bit, and um, I've got to get them more into their normal world. Um, in terms of what they do on a daily basis. You may have heard me talk to Lisa earlier saying, hey, I need to get you on my calendar now. I think we're all moving into this stabilization point. Um, and I think the, the good news is, and, and what I'm excited about really are the hires that we've made. Um, the, you know, Lisa and the work that she's been doing has really helped a lot in terms of really getting us to the point of stabilization, already given us some really good ideas. 
um, advised us and we've now made the appropriate change on simple things like um, you talked about it earlier, background checks. And it's amazing to learn the differences you find in these different systems. And, and so, the, the, you know, that's really the nitty gritty that we're working in. The one thing I did want to talk to the board about is as we look at this shift and as we look at really trying to then stabilize and get everyone more focused on what they do on a daily basis um, is also really um, looking at moving staff um, into the civic center um, with us because it's, um, it, it's incredibly difficult, especially for Karen and Kathy to have these two worlds um, and try to go back and forth. And, um, and then as we transition into them getting more into their normal world, then it's gonna be incredibly difficult for me to do that. Um, and when we look at the number of people that we really will have um, in the building, it makes more sense for us to bring them closer to us in, in the civic center. And I think that'll make us more uh, nimble, um, efficient and effective as, as we look to the future. Um, as part of that, it does give us some ideas in terms of looking at the facility um, I will tell you all, uh, I'm having conversations with um, the Veterans Community Project. I don't know if you're aware of that group, but they work um, with um, housing homeless veterans um, and providing resources in terms about the feasibility of them potentially leasing the building. Um, for us, that does a couple of things. A, it stays within mission in terms of what we're doing. B, it reduces our operational expense. And uh, C, it increases our, our revenue opportunity, it increases revenue for us. And so that really helps position, I think, it, uh, us in a really good spot, both financially and helps us um, reduce some of the, um, not reduce, but really, you know, work more closely with groups that we're all touching the, the same folks that we're trying to help in our community. I bring this up today because uh, between now and the next meeting, um, some of this may be moving from an operational perspective more quickly, um, and we may have folks in there. And I just wanted you all to, in, in our building, just wanted you all to know that um, as we continue to look to the future. So should we move on to... Oh, I do have one more thing. This is report. I actually do have one more thing. The other thing that um, we have chatted with um, the Housing Authority Board on, and we're gonna be bringing this together too, is, is really the transition on employment. Um, and we, we've got to talk to staff, but bringing folks more into the city um, and being in that city piece. And I think that's, we're still working through what that's gonna look like. That may be something that we talk to the Housing Authority Board on probably before we get to the next meeting of you all. Um, but it will, it'll be, um, what we're looking at is they actually become city employees and we're still working through some of those details. Um, uh, Aaron, Tom, what's, did the yep, what's the dist distribution of staff between um, the uh, housing authority building and the city? Are there other folks in both places now, or is it everybody's, I mean, obviously COVID people are working from home and that, but. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. you know, what I see is um, Kathy and Karen moving, you know, we um, as an authority contracted for the financial services to be through the city. Right. So, you know, having those folks adjacent to the other accountants. Um, and COVID world's much different because, you know, everybody's working remotely. But um, so accounting will need to be with accounting as we've talked about in terms of efficiencies. So what, it, what we really get down to then is we have three HCV people, uh, individuals as budgeted, um, Olivia, and Lisa is gonna be working in different places um, really remotely and um, working in different facilities. So then you have Lisa so we, we counted like five or six people in that entire office. Um, and, and for us, that's what I, I would rather them be closer to me, especially as we continue evolving. But I think there's only gonna be six people in that office. I, Karen? Nope. Go ahead, Kath. 
I was just going to say there's probably been five or six city staff that have been pretty much over at the LHA all the time, or at least part of the time. So we've had as many times more city staff at the LHA building than LHA staff (laughs) a couple of different times. So yeah, yeah, I mean, so you had Lee Tracy and you had Kendra and you had Susie and you had Deanne and you had Karen and you had Kathy. Um, those were all city staff that were over there and then, you know, just managing it in the world and how many we were supposed to have there. Um, so I think there's just more efficiency if we can just move five to six people over then have this continue back and forth. And the other thing I was just going to add is that it also provides the opportunity for um, some of our existing city staff to provide additional administrative support um, to some of the housing authority functions, especially um, with the housing choice voucher program. And, um, you know, so we would be able to provide um, reception assistance, direct phone answering, just just some other kinds of things that aren't, um, that we don't have available and funded for with the housing authority right now. So it does provide us an opportunity to provide enhanced services um, with, uh, you, you know, with staff that is, is certainly part of their, um, w- I, within their scope of, of work to be able to support. Yeah, we didn't even get into public information web services in the sense of transitioning the website over so we can make sure we keep it up to date and we have all the relevant information um, yeah, I didn't even get into that piece, but that all comes with proximity too. If there's nothing else on operations, should we roll to the regional property manager report? Lisa? Good morning. Again, that, um, well, it's been a busy six weeks. Um, all I've done is eat, sleep, and breathe LHA, <laughs> if you can imagine. Um, I'm excited to say that we have hired two property managers. One started last Friday, Andrea, who will be at the Hearthstone and Lodge. She is going to be there full time between those two properties. And then we will be bringing on Corinne Lindsay, and she will be starting approximately February 1st. And she will have the suites and the Aspen Meadows neighborhood and Aspen Meadows Senior. Let's see. Um, Over the last six weeks, I've been working on updating policies and procedures, working closely with the staff, trying to make sure each property is doing stuff the same way and consistently. We've brought in a new credit and criminal background check software that's giving us a better detailed oversight and outline of the criminal reports of credit reports that I don't think we had with the previous company, which gives us a better scoring model as well for new tenants and existing tenants. Um, and one thing I just got to say that I've been really excited to see over the last six weeks is with working with the city employees and some partnerships that we've been able to form, um, moving tenants, moving people in, prospects in, and having the senior center be able to assist us with funding for new residents or emergency situations that they've been able to partner with us and help us and just make the quality of life for some of our residents even better. And it's amazing to have that support in a city. So I just want to give that shout out. I'm blown away by how seamless that has flown. Then moving on to the attached reports, as you can see on the um, gross rent potential, I just um, gave them some notes about our vacancies. For Spring Creek, I'm excited to say that the one vacant that has been vacant for 165 days actually moved in on Friday. So that's great progress. We are working on a lot of these Aspen Meadows neighborhood. Um, One has already moved in. Um, The PBV wait list is being called for. And um, we have another vacant that has a lot of brand new, almost new, hardly used furniture that we're working with Habitat Humanity to come pick up this week to um, get that donated and then we can get that unit rented. The Heartstone, um, we have a couple vacancies over there. We're gonna have a transfer from the lodge to accommodate a resident. The suites, we are, have the seven vacant units. One's the manager's unit, which the new manager will be living on site for a couple of months to help make sure that property's running well, that she has a presence. 
get to know the residents, get to know the community and work on that. We are working with mental health partners and who are contacting 20 names for their wait list for their four vacancies. And then we have um, LHA has two vacancies of our own that we will be working on once we get some um, full-time staff there. Um, Village Place has had three vacancies. One was occupied on Friday. We placed a Craigslist and we think we rented the studio Friday as well. So leaving one um, two bedroom unit to rent, we did lower the deposit from a full month's rent down to 500 to kind of make it a little bit more appealing to those looking. And then Aspen Meadows Senior, who's going through the renovations, um, we have five vacants. One has been renovated and is ready for moving. So we're gonna start leasing that one. And the other four will be worked on as the units come available. Great, thank you for that update. Any questions for Lisa? Uh, and, let's and, move on to, since, or go ahead, Karen. You know, I, I just I wanted to, say, I just wanted to reiterate, I think what Harold talked about, you know, what, um, what an incredible, what incredible contributions that Lisa has made in her short time here. We, we, we love her that she's living and breathing LHA. That's probably not a sustainable path, but for right now, it is a much needed path. And, and I think uh, to just reiterate what, um, what Lisa commented on, the, the vision that we had for how the resources of the city and how the resources of the LHA could really come together to optimally serve um, the residents of our communities, our LHA communities, we, we have seen that in action in several ways in just as we had hoped and had envisioned, you know, not everything is perfect, um, but, you know, but we also found that when we have an, encountered, you know, challenges, we, we, we are able to bring together the resources of both entities, um, you know, to really do our best at um, at, at, at problem solving and turning things around. So we are seeing evidence of what we had hoped for actually coming to fruition. And, and we just can't thank Lisa enough for um, all of the extra effort she's putting together in, in the first six weeks. Thank you. And, and there's more to come, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but we won't work it to death. So thank you. Harold, did you have something? Yeah, I forgot to say too, um, I know we'd had some conversations and, and concerns regarding some security at different facilities. Uh, we did meet with a um, security company and we have a proposal for um, Village Place that um, we need to finish up on, but I also am waiting on a proposal for Aspen Meadow based on um, the renovation. I think part of that is because we are looking at cameras too that's going to need to be more toward the end of the project um, because you don't want to do it and then have to take it off because of exterior work. And so um, you'll be hearing more of the security piece as we continue to move forward. Thank you. I, I do have a question for Lisa and probably Harold. I'm not sure who to direct it to. Um, you mentioned that Corinne is the new manager at the Swedes and at AMA and AMN. And I'm just wondering why that got coupled together then. She, um, she's coming from a larger community of 380 units. She's worked with seniors for the last eight years. Mm -hmm. um, and since the neighborhood and the suites are both kind of a family comparative properties, we figured that would be a good pairing. And with Aspen Meadows um, senior right there, that would be- And that fits. It yeah, fits. it just fits together. Okay. And then Erin um, is back there between Aspen Meadows Senior and Aspen Meadows Neighborhood. Erin is? Yes, she's yeah. there as a full-time body now. Oh, okay. Awesome. Okay. Yeah, okay. so think of it manager, assistant manager, sort of team. That the sure. manager has that broader oversight. Yes. And we're okay. finding that's going to work more, and we're going to look at that as a broader framework. Okay. 
and I'm I'm only talking from being um, I'm sheltered in the hotel now because it's my wing that's being <laughs> renovated, um, and I didn't know there was a shift in managers. <laughs> so I'm assuming there's been some communication out there. That there will be because this just started on Friday as Andrea came on board. Um, okay. All as right. we stay in level orange, Michelle and I are working together to put together some small meetings for the residents that mm -hmm. we will kind of do introductions at each of the communities so that you guys can see the faces in small groups of like six to seven residents. Okay. Cause it, it's just um, confusing with all the construction going on and yes. then to have a change in cause that's twice now it's changed, but I'm, I'm glad to hear the reason for it. And um, it sounds very good. Um, I'm just feeling a little out of the loop um, and, and, um, and I just want to make sure everybody knows what's going on because it gets, it gets a little, what is it? And, and with construction that we're all kind of what next? Okay. You understand? I yeah. understand. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I think those are good points. And Lisa, I will echo that. I'm glad that you're living and breathing the LHA. Although these days I want to make sure you're wearing a mask when you're doing the breathing part. Oh yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that word makes me nervous like it didn't used to. Uh, let's roll on to 9C uh, and get a little more of an update. Or Tom, did you have something? What was 9C? I just had some other questions. Uh, 9C's report on the Aspen Meadows Senior Apartments Rehab. I had some other other questions. So, uh, you, you know, previously we had gone over that we were getting a Yardi support um, and Yardi training. Is that still ongoing or? Okay. Yes, it is through the end of this month. Okay, perfect. And we uh, set all the employees up on a Yardi training system as well. Okay. Kendra, I'm assuming, had, had that previously? when she was helping, help, helping out the LHA, at, at least some. Yeah. She, she's still working on that as well. Yeah. And then the, the other thing you mentioned, the, we have a housing choice voucher person coming on board. Um, is one of their first tasks gonna be looking at the available housing choice vouchers that we might still have sitting on the table? We're actually still working on that with Kendra. Um, and our consultant accounting consultant. So apparently some of the data that had been entered last year um, was not accurate. Um, and so HUD and the accounting firm are working on reconciling everything and that's what we're waiting on. And then it, everything has to go into the two year tool which HUD requires. And so we are um, hoping to wrap that up here in the next month or so and, and have a better handle on what we're able to do. Yep. All right, if there are no other comments, let's move on to the update on the rehab at Aspen Meadows. All right, that's me. Um, so <clears throat> we, the interior work is about 60% complete. As Jean mentioned, the third floor south wing move out was completed January 11th. Um, we have now renovated the north wing and have started on the south wing. Work during the next three weeks will include those units on the third floor south, the second floor gathering room, and continuing work on the first floor lobby. Um, we should be hearing about the elevator work schedule very soon. We're anxious to know when that's going to happen because some residents are going to have to be relocated likely again. We were trying to align it with... Um, um, the majority of people who would be out um, that have disabilities or that are in wheelchairs or have um, mobility that they ha are going to have to be out during the elevator and um, it's just a little bit behind where we thought it was going to be. Um, we did, um, I do want to report though that while the entire elevator isn't going to be replaced, the majority of the components of the elevator are going to re be replaced um, and should, according to the company, leave us running smoothly for the next 20 plus years. Um, so we're looking forward to that and being done with that. Um, 
exterior work to date includes the substantial completion on the roof, but most of the exterior work, including window replacement and siding will be March through June. Um, speaking to Harold's um, thoughts about the security system, we don't wanna put that up and then rip it off with the siding. Um, the full job is about 36% complete in terms of contract billing. Um, we have used only about 18% of our contingency budget. <laughs> Um, and because inter interior work is where most of the need for contingency was expected, um, we are thinking that we are going to have quite a bit of that contingency money we can reallocate um, and add value to the project. So some of the things we're looking at right now, um, exploring the pricing and options, is doing a full parking lot paving. Um, only two thirds of the lot was originally proposed to save on budget. So this would put all of the asphalt into the same life, ci life cycle, which would be better. Um, we have an opportunity to improve safety at the entrances and exits by changing directional striping signage um, to one way if feasible. So that is something being explored. Um, the common area furnishings package, we are looking at replacing that. That was not called to be replaced, um, but with the new look um, of the rooms, it's the furniture is going to look really outdated. <laughs> so um, we're looking at that and the cost for that. Um, an interior signage package to update the look of the directional signage and unit numbering um, is something that is, um, is, could be looked at and needed. Um, the security uh, video security system that Harold mentioned, we're getting pricing on that and what that would take. Um, and then potentially, this is at the bottom of the list, but um, in case we have extra money, uh, maybe some landscaping upgrades. Um, um, and then one thing that Molly wanted to report back that she realized that Councilman Waters had asked about the slip factor on the new flooring that's been installed with the vinyl. Um, what she has said is what they, um, the new floors have more groove to them than what um, normal vinyl does or the vinyl that was in place um, in the past. Um, and the new vinyl flooring that we're, we've installed is acceptable for UFAS units, which takes that into consideration um, as well. So it is pretty safe. Um, we haven't had any complaints about the vinyl once the residents have moved back into their units. Um, so we're thinking that we're, we're pretty good with the vinyl, at least at this point, so. That's the report on that. Are there any questions? No questions. Go ahead, Arlene, go ahead. I just wanted to comment, uh, Kathy, on you guys replacing that common area furniture. I agree with you that it's definitely gonna be outdated if we don't do something. All right, well, thank you for that update. It sounds like things are moving along nicely. It'll be excited to see that project come to a conclusion. Uh, let's roll on to something less exciting. <laughs> a, a, a phrase that I was, the one thing, positive thing I can think of that COVID brought was I didn't have to hear the phrase voluntary compliance agreement for a while, um, but I knew it wouldn't go away. So let's have a report on the, the VCA with HUD, although we've talked about it quite a bit up till now. Yeah. Um, well, it did, it kind of went in the background for y'all, but we've been working on it, <laughs> moving things forward, although some things did get suspended, like the um, inspection and the plan and um, that kind of thing. So um, just to, trying to do a real quick update here. Um, we have completed our trainings for um, staff that was required. Um, so that we're in compliance with, we just have to ensure new staff um, are trained within 180 days, and that's really on the um, fair housing and the 504 compliance. Um, we have to request an additional extension to the unit accessibility. Obviously, um, we haven't been able to get in and inspect um, the properties with um, a third party um, architectural firm to go through all the common areas and all the units and all the properties to provide feedback on what we need to do to get into accessibility compliance everywhere except for Aspen Meadows um, uh, uh, senior apartments. 
Um, so that will be requesting an additional extension there for that, for the common areas and for the needs assessment and transition plan. Um, the third party certification of the AMSA units, um, Aspen Meadows Apartments um, is underway um, as those units are completed. Um, and then um, we have complied with the future alterations um, policy, which is the policy you just recommended for approval, the 504 reasonable accommodation policy um, and the um, tenant selection policy. So those are all um, in compliance and considered completed. Um, there is a 504 tracking component that I do have to send a report in um, on that. Um, which I'll get done here in the next couple of weeks. Um, let's see what else is outstanding. The grievance policy, I need to get that completed and submitted. Um, we've already complied with the assistance animal policy um, as part of the 504 accommodation. We've already updated the application and that's all complete. Um, the maximum utilization of accessible units has been um, completed. Accessible housing list has been completed. Uh, uh, uh. So it's really some record keeping and the, the annual report that um, needs to be submitted um, within probably the next month and a couple of extensions around the, um, the unit um, analysis and, and transition plan. For that so I'd say we're pretty about halfway done halfway not done <laughs> um, and then I'll just see how long we're gonna have to keep reporting once we've completed everything and um, how, how long we'll have to do that okay Kathy that's obviously I... a huge or, or go, I was gonna say that's a huge task yeah and um, you know I do recall when this first came in and we were digesting it and uh, um, LHA staff were running around with their hair on fire trying to figure out how the heck we were going to do this. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's far from complete, but it's, it's comforting to hear how much progress has been made. So thank you. Jean? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put an explanation point behind that. It is a lot of progress. Um, the only uh, question I had is at one point we were looking at revising that 25 page lease agreement. Uh, is that in the works on some level? Yes, that's actually, I have, they've given me all the leases from all the surrounding housing authorities, Okay. all the current leases in use. And that is on my list of things to go through Tackle. and ed revise. Okay, great, great. I will just add that um, we have found HUD to be very accommodating. Um, I don't know if it's just because of COVID and knowing that there's a lot that we we simply can't get done or whether they are putting their money where they said they were going to or walking the walk, I guess, um, where they said they would be um, fairly reasonable about um, um, moving us forward through this and if there were glitches or things that needed to be accommodated. Um, but they have been so far extremely um, workable with us and giving us extensions and um, helping, et cetera. So that has been a very pleasant change from the tone that it took from the beginning <laughs> um, and, and where we started. So yay. Kathy, I do recall that uh, as we were approaching the plan for this um, collaboration between LHA and the city, that HUD did ask a few questions um, and was, was, I won't say concerned, but curious about what this meant. Has there been any further discussion about that and what's their, their take on where we are now? Harold, do you wanna fill that or? You, you go for it and then I'll jump in. <laughs> Um, yeah, so our um, city attorneys did meet with HUD um, and provided them with a copy of the IGA. Um, we got comments back last week after we'd already passed it. Um, so they weren't very timely with their comments. Um, from my standpoint, I don't think it was anything that was too terribly 
um, off-putting or things that can't be can't be dealt with. Um, but it has been um, that has been probably a little bit more challenging just as far as the the timeliness of feedback um, that we have gotten and actually knowing how how much leverage they have, I guess. <laughs> um, with us, we have tried to follow past um, practices of other housing authorities that have moved into the city or into a county. Um, so um, some of the comments were a little interesting um, that they provided, so. Yeah, I think, I think part of the question is, um, A, first and foremost, what's HUD's lane? Um, and are they staying within their lane? Because I think some of the comments, they were outside of their lane. So when you look at some of our properties, obviously they're fully in the lane for HCV and how you're moving through that, but that doesn't necessarily translate to those areas that are not under HUD. So, you know, the two sides, you have the hearth and lodge that are under HUD, but that's different than Creek and Fall River. And so, parsing where their lane is, I think is something we need to do. Um, and, and we need to have a little bit more work on it because that was what for me was unclear. Um, the other piece on it um, is to what Kathy said in terms of what other groups are doing. And how they approach it. So I think we need to work a little bit on that. Um, but I think it really just depends on, I mean, we're gonna have to dive into that a little bit. Uh, but in talking to Tim and Tim's response to my email, there was only one thing that was there. But I think there's different ways to, to handle that issue in terms of who pays for what. And I think we just need to be more clear in terms of where the money's coming from, because I think they were unclear on that and really show that it's not coming from HUD funds, but it's coming from the other funds available. Um, or, and or attaching the work that we've done specifically to the HUD piece. And I think that's easy enough. Um, I think the big issue that they had too was just um, in, in a position of where um, the, the executive board member concept with me, I think created them some anxiety because I was both a vo voting member and the executive. And I think this cleaned that up because I'm not. And, and so um, I think we can move through these pieces. I think they're also being very accommodating, um, just to be honest, because they, they know that but for this, this probably falls on them eventually. And uh, so they're willing to work um, through this with, with all of us as we continue to move forward. So maybe that's our leverage. I mean, it, yeah, I think they I think they definitely get it. So. Yeah. Uh, so this, this last question is not on the VCA, but it's just made me think about it. Um, we also have an agreement with the ACLU that obligated us to adopt a policy relating to entry into units. And I recall discussing this with Jillian back kind of mid to late summer of 2019. Um, and I, but I don't recall whether we actually adopted a policy or not. Maybe we did and I've forgotten it, but I just wanted to to put that on the list. If someone remembers that we've done it, great. If not, maybe by the time we roll around next month or so, we could just double check that we've closed that loop. Who has that settlement agreement? Uh, I've got a copy of it. I'll send it, I'll send it out. That'd be great if you can send it to us so we can make sure that we're adhering to that. I know that we are, really strict with the 48 hour policy in terms of the notice that we're putting on the doors and, and respond. Mm -hmm. to that. I just, it'd be good for us to see that too. Yeah. As I recall, it was pretty, we worked hard to make it uh, fairly general where I think, I think it said we will collaborate with the ACLU and adopt a policy regarding entry into units, something as simplistic as that, but I'll find the actual document and send it to you. Do you know if Jillian had any conversations with them? So my last, I just, I just looked at my email. My last email was um, from mid to late summer where she asked who the point of contact was at the ACLU to start talking about that. Uh, and I gave her 
the information that I had, and then I don't know what happened to it after that. Okay. So if there are no other comments or questions on the city report, let's roll to item 10, other business. I'll throw out one item. I, I've We've been doing this, but the, the bylaws, the LHA bylaws that govern our operations say that, that we are able to adopt Robert's rules of order for how we run these meetings. We didn't actually formally decide to do it. I just kind of started going down that path. Um, and maybe between now and next meeting, think about it. But you know, my thought is that, that it's a little formal, but that structure works pretty well. Uh, unless someone would rather have a more informal way of uh, running these meetings. And if you haven't, if you don't want to be more informal, I would suggest that we just vote to implement Robert's Rules of Orders for the advisory board meetings moving forward. I think it's a good idea just so that we can have um, a clean and accurate description of, of things that we decide on. Um, for recommendations that we make to the actual board and there won't be any confusion about what our intent was. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree uh, basically in principle and I like the fact that we're getting motions on the floor before we discuss. Um, I think that's helping to clarify uh, you know, comments and what have you. Um, Robert's rules of order can get very, very um, picky um, so I think if we use them as a guideline, as opposed to adopting everything that's in that, that um, delightful book, <laughs> I, I think we'll do well. Okay. I, that is a great suggestion. So, so maybe, maybe what we ought to do is generally follow mm -hmm. the, the proceedings as outlined in Robert's rules um, with some flexibility. And since we're just generally following it, I'm going to say that we're not going to even need to vote on that. We'll just that, that will just be the the chair's prerogative for the remainder of this year. And then, uh, if anyone wants to suggest a change in the future, we can do that. Is there any other business before we adjourn? Arlene, I just have a couple of questions, kind of follow up questions. Has the 2020 financial year uh, been closed for the LHA, and if it has, have the uh, city staff been properly compensated? So that is what we're working on now. Um, and and so Joanne just and I just finished um, how, what that's going to look like. So two points, what it looks like looking back and what it looks like looking forward. And, and so I'm going to be finalizing that, um, having conversations with the new LHA board um, in, in terms of this issue and understand as the executive and, and what that's gonna look like moving forward. So generally what, we're, what we've come to the conclusion of on this is, um, creating a new category um, of compensation that is um, think of it as stipend for acquisitions and um, mergers. So it's acquisition and merger stipend um, based on X amount of time. Um, and that lets Joanne then look backwards and forward um, to try to net that out on both ends um, to make up for the work that was done in 2020. And then what does that look like going forward into 21? Okay. I just got the email last night. Okay. I needed to see what money was there too. That was the other piece mm -hmm. that we needed to understand what that looked like in terms of salary savings and work with Kendra on that. We finished that a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And the other question I had was at one time, a person from uh, Spring Creek uh, called in, or Springbrook, I guess is what it is, um, called in and she'd had, during the time that the lights were out in the parking lot, her truck stolen and she was concerned about getting that back. Do you know if that was resolved? 
was resolved in terms of, I believe the lights getting fixed. Um, I think the, the question on that one was, there were other issues there in terms of when they, when they actually went out versus when the, the crime occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis sent us that information. Well, did she get her truck back? I guess is probably. <clears throat> that I'm not sure about. Um, mm -hmm. On the police side, I don't know if they ever uh, found the truck or if the truck was actually stolen or if it was just broken into. Um, I recall it was just broken into. I don't think it was I stolen. I don't think it was stolen. I thought, thought it was just broke, broke in. I think her windows were broken because I was wondering if we if we had any obligation or if we should mm -hmm. offer to pay, but um, nobody had mentioned that, and I don't know that we do. All right, any other business? Seeing none, I will consider us adjourned since we don't have to follow the rules exactly. <clears throat> Thank you all. We will uh, reconvene the third Tuesday of next month, which I think is the 16th, if my math is correct. But whatever date the third Tuesday is, we'll see you at eight o'clock that morning. Thank you all. Hi. Hey, Lisa, Kathy, yes. Karen, I'm gonna call you real quick. Okay. Oh,